Welcome to art class. We are time traveling with 7R2. And I have posted some new game development tutorials in the art classroom, which I would like to kind of walk through with you. This is going to be a lot of me talking. And if you have some thoughts or if you want to share something about what you're seeing, maybe you have some experience with some of this stuff, go ahead and put it in the chat. And don't forget to hit like and subscribe. I've got a head-to-head -head strategy board game tutorial. I've got an engine building game tutorial. And I've got a chance strategy card game tutorial. I still would like to explore tabletop RPGs. So the most famous example being Dungeons and Dragons, which I have actually never played. I've never played a tabletop RPG. And uh, if any of you have, please share it with us. I really want to know what your experience has been, what you enjoy about it, how these games work, because I only have a foggy idea. Uh, and, and that's after many conversations with friends trying to pick their brains about like, wait, what is it? And kind of not being able to wrap my head around how open-ended uh, tabletop RPGs are. And of course, those evolved uh, throughout the, the last number of decades into other forms of RPGs, including live action role-playing games, which is where people actually dress up and play out the game uh, in an open space. You know, all these things are kind of extensions of the gaming world. Let's start by looking at uh, chance strategy card games. These tutorials are kind of like, let's say you want to develop this kind of game. Here's the thought process that you might want to think about as we move through the steps to do that. Most card games have elements of both chance and strategy and can be played with nothing but a deck of cards and in some cases, some way of keeping score. Gameplay is usually turn-based, although some games such as War require players to play cards simultaneously, sorry, simultaneously during each turn. Chance is typically generated by shuffling the cards before they are dealt or drawn, while strategy uh, has to do with the decisions you make while playing cards, uh, drawing them, discarding them, and so on, um, and sometimes even betting, right? Uh, that gambling element of uh, using uh, betting as a display of confidence to try to throw other players uh, in their strategies. Um, the only card game I can think of that involves no strategy whatsoever is war. So, uh, I would start by learning a classic card game. If this is something you're interested in developing, learn a classic card game. Uh, learning classic card games is a good idea because card games are often part of important social experiences. It's also easier than ever before because now you can download one right onto your phone or computer and play uh, right away or look up the rules online and use a deck of cards you've already got. Decks of cards cost a few dollars and can be purchased at almost any grocery store. Here's a short list of card games that I recommend learning. Spades, Hearts, BS, Rummy, or 500, or Gin Rummy, Crazy Eights, Cribbage, Five Cards, Stud Poker, Hold'em Poker, Blackjack. Uh, a few special notes from Mr. Z. My favorite card game is Cribbage. Uh, cribbage involves a board and pegs as scorekeeping tools, but you, it could be played with just a paper and pencil to keep score, much in the same way as you would with like 500 uh, Rummy. I'm also very fond of Hold'em Poker. Many versions of poker involve gambling as part of gameplay. Don't gamble, you're in middle school, but which you can do with like poker chips or any other stand-in for currency. Okay, so uh, to learn one of the games on the previous slide, you're gonna type it into Google, followed by the phrase free online, something like that. Uh, type it into wherever you get your mobile apps, read about it on Wikipedia. Watch uh, YouTube demo videos, tutorial videos. Uh, there are going to be lots of different videos on YouTube on how to play any one of these games. 
How to build a good card-based game. Of all the games we're learning about right now, creating a card game is perhaps best suited to starting with a modification of an, of an existing game. Modifying a classic card game can be the most accessible because most people have a deck of cards already, right? Uh, this does not mean it is the easiest option and it is difficult to invent a card game that is fun, challenging, and original. There are many great card games that have been invented that just aren't as good as the four or five most popular ones, no matter how trendy they become. That said, some non-classic card games have become very important in household gaming, and you should check these out as well. To the right, we have a short list. Uno, I think you all know pretty well. Uh, there's one called Set, which is a really great card game. Um, it's not like playing cards, cards, because you're not, it doesn't deal with values and hierarchies and things like that, but uh, it is a very good logical reasoning game. Uh, memory, of course, we've talked about in uh, another lesson. The Fox in the Forest is a really great one. I didn't put it on here, but there's another really great guard, card game called Arboretum, which you should check out. And uh, Fox in the Forest and Arboretum are both mentioned on Shut Up, Sit Down. Uh, so check it out there uh, or elsewhere online, wherever you read about games. Um, for the purposes of this demonstration, we're gonna walk through the process of modifying a classic card game, which is spoons. Before modifying a game, it is helpful to be able to present the rules of that game. The bicycle company, which makes the famous playing cards that uh, depict a cyclist on the back, has a list of card game rules on their website. You should check it out. The, uh, the website is a veritable masterclass on how to write the rules of a game uh, so that they can be easily understood. In fact, the rules are so well written that I'm just gonna copy them verbatim. So we have the pack, a standard deck of 52 cards is used plus a number of spoons using one fewer spoon than the number of players playing the game. Uh, object of the game, players will take turns to collect four of a kind. Once someone does, everyone tries to grab a spoon. Without a spoon, you get a letter. If a player yells S-P-O-O-N, they're out. The last player standing wins. So we don't really yet understand from this uh, what the gameplay is like, but it tells us. The deal, arrange the spoons in a small circle in the center of the table and deal four cards to each player. Next, the play. Each player tries to make four of a kind. The dealer takes a card off the top of the deck to have five cards in their hand, removes one and passes it face down to the left. Each player discards to the person on their left. So you pick up the card, look at it, discard one to your left. The last player places their discard into a trash pile. Cards are picked up and passed quickly around the table until someone gets four of a kind and takes a spoon from the center. Once the player with four of a kind takes a spoon, anyone can take a spoon. The player left without a spoon gets a letter. If at any time the draw card runs out, pause to reshuffle the trash pile and keep going. Okay, so it's kind of like you're given a task to distract you uh, while people try to figure out who's gonna be the first one to take a spoon. Once that spoon gets taken, you're supposed to still be so distracted that you don't think to take one. And that's pretty much it. So how to keep score. The winner is the last player remaining. Players move closer to elimination each time they don't get a spoon and take the next letter in the word spoon. Spell it and you're out. So uh, each round, somebody's gonna get a letter, right? So there's, how many people can play? Uh, I don't know, Tina, that didn't say right there, did it? And that is just something that you would include when you write the rules of your game. Um, I would think it's very, very uh, not fun to play Spoon with fewer than four people. That's my thought. Uh, now that we've read the rules of the game, it's time to come up with a modification. For this assignment, you must modify the game in such a way that it fundamentally changes the game's strategy and therefore creates a new original game. So reversing the direction in which cards are discarded, for example, would not be sufficient nor would merely changing the spoons to forks, right? You understand why you're, it's, it's not a different game yet. Uh, the best place to start to modify a game is from experience. So if you haven't played the game before or in a very long time, play with your family or friends. 
Take notes during and after play to determine what the best part of the game was and what was the worst. Have a discussion about which elements made the game work and which ones didn't really serve the purpose of making it fun and challenging. Sometimes a rule seems unnecessary until you realize that it serves some important function. Sometimes the main objective could actually be improved. Um, the game of spoons is fun and challenging because you have to pay a lot of attention to two things at once, making four of a kind in your hand and the status of the spoons on the table, right? Two things. Always try to identify what makes the game fun and challenging first. Then try to focus on those elements in your modification. So I would choose to modify the game so that it is more difficult to pay attention to both the spoons and the cards at the same time and to extend the period of time that players need to do so. So those are my goals. I've played spoons. I've decided these are the modifications I want to make because that's where the game kind of doesn't quite do it for me. Like it's a little bit too uh, not, so not, not intellectual once it gets going. So I want to make it a little bit more challenging to actually stay on top of what's going on. So how do I do that? Well, in most games of spoons, once the first player has four of a kind and picks up a spoon, other players do the same very rapidly as they realize it's open season on the spoons, right? So the game turns into many rounds that each might drag on for a while and then quickly end after the first spoon is picked up. Unless you're lucky enough to be playing with many players who are just really slow, right? But what if picking up the second spoon wasn't so simple? What makes the second spoon simple? Unless you're the first player to get four of a kind, you're constantly checking the table to see if anyone's picked up a spoon yet, right? In fact, you're doing that anyway. So for this modification, we have to come up with a reason to keep people distracted from looking at the table more and also give them an additional challenge to prevent them from picking up the second spoon so quickly. So here's my modification that I came up with, and this was a year ago, so... Who knows what I was thinking? After the first player has achieved four of a kind and taken a spoon, another player may not take a second spoon until they get a run of four, meaning four cards whose values are in sequence. In my modification, an ace has a value that's both one and one higher than the king. So a run could be ace, two, three, four, jack, queen, king, ace, king, ace, two, three, and so on. Only once two spoons have been taken, other players may then take spoons at will. Once a player has taken a spoon, they must continue to receive and discard as normal, regardless of what's in their hand. I just want to say something. I'm reading this modification that I made last year, and I'm thinking to myself, if a student turned this into me, as is, for their final project for game design, I'd be a little bit like, so you added another like challenge round to spoons. This wouldn't quite do it for me in terms of like really making a new original game, right? So I want you to think about why that might be. We haven't, we haven't fundamentally changed the game of spoons at all. It's still spoons. We just added another, you know, another challenge to it. So it's, it's kind of like spoons on steroids, I guess. I don't know. I'm reading this and I'm thinking, this isn't, this isn't up to snuff with Mr. Z. So uh, it's good to see examples like this. Maybe this is a good start, but maybe we could take this in some other direction so that uh, it's less just spoons with like a tail on it. You know what I mean? Good to be aware of the process of how we come up with those modifications better to continue thinking about modifications so that we are coming up with an original idea. Uh, and if you just change the spoons to forks or sporks, as we said earlier, not a meaningful modification, right? Okay, so let's take a look at head-to-head uh, -head strategy. And this is something that I talked about with some of my classes last week. Um, one really interesting thing that you can do in order to create a game is to create, try, try to create a board game out of something that is not a board game. And the example I came up with for head-to-head -head strategy uses that technique. 
So we're going to talk about that in a second. Head-to-head -head strategy games are typically, but not always, played on a game board. Head-to-head -head strategy involves players doing things strategically in order to give themselves an advantage while simultaneously giving their opponents a disadvantage towards some goal. Here are some examples of head-to-head -head strategy. Tic-tac-toe, Mancala, Checkers, Chess, Reverse Eye, Othello, Pente, Go, Chick-a-Pig, Backgammon. Uh, those are all examples of head-to-head -head strategy games where it's your mind against somebody else's mind and what you see is everything that's in front of you, right? Nothing is concealed. Um, if you are not familiar with any of the games on the previous slide, now's a good time to learn one. Download a free version onto your phone, break out an old set you have in a closet somewhere, go online, learn the rules, try it out. How to build a good head-to-head -head strategy game. The most difficult part is getting started because you have to decide what gameplay is going to look like and within that, what the goals, advantages, and disadvantages will be. That's why it's a maybe a good strategy to try to modify a game that's not even a board game. Like you could take Mario Kart, right? You could create a donut-shaped uh, game board with uh, like a checker pattern on it. Right, take a grid, bend it into a donut, and then uh, randomly assign obstacles and pro and like uh, weapons or tools or whatever it is, whatever you call the things that you pick up, that you then shoot at people, right? And uh, and you maybe have a dice roll or something that determines how far you go and what you pick up, and you yeah, you know, like the red shells and the green shells, right? Uh, and maybe what you pick up determines what you're able to do in the next turn. And you can, like, shoot a shell at somebody and then they lose a turn. You know what I mean? Like, if you've played Mario Kart for Nintendo, then you probably, could, if you played it a lot and you understand how the game works, you can probably start to be creative and think of ways you could turn that into a board game. And since we don't have the money to take on Nintendo in the courts, we're going to change all the names around and call it something super original, right? So uh, if your game is too simple, like tic-tac-toe, the outcome will be determined by basic math, and it won't be fun for people after a short time playing it. I think we've established that much earlier in the unit. Games like Go and Chess are really good because they're reasonably simple to learn, but they take a long time and great skill to master. Uh, they're simpler cousins include reverse Iotello, checkers respectively, which can be learned and mastered with relatively more ease. Backgammon is a great game because while pitting each player's strategy against the other, it also has an element of chance from which each player may benefit or suffer depending on how well they use it. Uh, because of the difficulty in getting started, uh, I would really suggest modifying an existing game or even adapting a game that's not a head-to-head -head strategy board or card game. Uh, so for that reason, in this presentation, I'm going to demonstrate how I would adapt the outdoor adventure game, Capture the Flag, into a head-to-head -head board game. The following slides walk you through the process of thinking about and creating the adaptation. You may adapt this game or another one, making your own decisions about how to complete that adaptation. Capture the flag. So in Capture the Flag, the regular version that you play outside with friends or the version that exists in some first-person shooter video games, right? Players are divided into two teams. Does it have to be two? Maybe not. Uh, but let's just stick to two for now. And if you want to come up with a modification with other number of teams, you can. The game is played on a field with a line dividing the field into two territories with a flag on a base somewhere in each territory. The objective is for each team to move into the other team's territory, capture the flag literally by literally picking it up and carrying it back to their own base, right? However, players can also capture each other, usually by tagging them, so they must attack and defend their flags in such a way as to avoid capture. In some versions of the game, captured players are out for the remainder of the game, while in other versions, they are brought to the opponent's base. And once there, the only way that captured players can be released is if their free teammates tag them. Further modifications exist to determine what happens once captured players are freed. 
The game becomes more fun and challenging when it is played on an interesting uh, bit of terrain or with other variables that can be used to capture or avoid capture. When I was in like sixth grade, I went to a camp and we played capture the flag. There were like 30 of us and we played it at twilight and there was a fog that came down and we played it at, like there was a big field like the size of uh, a football field and the game crossed the football field and on either end there were woods and that's where the flags were so there was fog on the field and it went into the woods and it was like the most amazing game of capture the flag it was so cool like the only way that could have been cooler is if we had lasers <laughs> right uh so by the way what you just read is a good example of a complete game explanation it starts with a broad description of how and under what conditions the game is played. Next, it states the objective and the rules. If it was a turn-based game, it would state what happens on each turn and the conditional rules that apply to each turn. If this happens, then that happens as a result, right? It is written in such a way that anyone can read the explanation and then understand the game without ever having played it in any form. To adapt this game to a board, we first need to identify the elements we want to use, right? It's kind of like when, you're, when you wanna cook something, you wanna write a recipe, you need to first list your ingredients, right? Before you give the instructions. So we know we're gonna need some game pieces. Game pieces are the board, that's our landscape. Uh, we need players, right? Those are our little players. Uh, we need flags. And on the board somewhere, we have to have bases. That's where the flag lives or where you take captured players. We need some gameplay elements in the instructions. So we have to think about how uh, players move around the board. We have to think about how capturing works, whether we're talking about capturing the flag or capturing other players and so on. What else? Uh, can we randomize the landscape? Can we make the game more interesting by being different every time it's played? Uh, this could be done with additional unmovable pieces that are placed at various parts of the board at the beginning of the game, maybe at random. I don't know, this is for you to figure out as you create the design, right? And these are things that you wanna be thinking about during that uh, process. So in real life capture the flag, all the action takes place at once in real time and players move and capture however they are able. To adapt the gameplay for a board, the action would probably have to be turn-based. If you can think of a way for it to not be turn-based, good on you. I'd love to see that work. Uh, remember chance versus strategy. This is the part where you can decide whether to include an element of chance in the gameplay. For example, if players are moved in each turn, should the characteristics and conditions of their moves, for example, how far they can go or what they can accomplish, be determined by something like a dice roll, like in Risk, or could it be determined uh, by something that they or their opponent can change deliberately? Or should it just be based on a fixed number or player attribute, like in chess, right? In chess, you get one move, and the players can move in chess according to what type of player they are. Game pieces, the board, right? Let's start with the board. It needs to be subdivided into sections or units that players can move through in order to move, capture, carry, and otherwise manipulate the other game pieces, right? For this reason, a grid or maybe honeycomb type matrix might work best. It's really up to you and what you think would be the best fit. You should experiment. There are lots of other ways to make a matrix than just four or six sided units. The board will need to have a boundary between the territories, right, for each uh, team. And if you want this to be a game for more than two players, you are going to need to be able to create more than two territories on the board. And if you want to add an interesting element of chance, there should be a way to randomly create uh, changes in the terrain. Uh, maybe by having tiles that sit on it and move around. Perhaps to keep things fair, all terrain modifications should be symmetrical across territories. I don't know, what do you think? Maybe there's another way to create that necessary balance in the gameplay. Uh, you wanna have balance in your gameplay because otherwise the game is lots of fun for one person and not very fun for the other person. And then five minutes later, it's not fun for anyone because if you're playing against somebody who is not having fun, they will find a way to keep you from having fun also. Trust me. Uh, balance is a necessary, okay, I think I just said that. You also have more of a sense of accomplishment 
when uh, you've won in a fair fight, right? Uh, game pieces continued. Players, yeah, you need players. Each team is going to have to have a certain number of players. This number should be proportionate to the number of units in the matrix or grid of the board so that the board is not overcrowded and the team can still achieve their goals, both defensively, uh, capturing other players, and offensively, capturing the flag or freeing their own players, right? Uh, the players of each team should be distinct, different shape or color, some way of, of telling them apart. Uh, you're going to need flags, right? Each team is going to have to have a flag. The flag should be a game piece that can be moved, either by placing it directly on top of or adjacent to their own player, and then moving the player with the flag, right? Because that's how you capture it, you carry it somewhere. Uh, bases. Each team will need to have a base. This is where the opponent's flag is held and where the team's flag is returned to once captured. The same base may be used to hold hostages or a separate base may be used. Again, that's something you're going to figure out while designing your game. One interesting reason to have a separate base for hostages is that the opposing team must then decide whether to expend resources on freeing its captured players or on capturing the flag. They're not going to the same place for one-stop shopping, right? This also means the defending team must choose whether to expend resources defending the flag base or the hostage base. Right? You're, you're forcing both teams to make these terrible choices, and that's what makes the game fun. The, the way the game is normally played, the base cannot be moved, although having a movable base could create an interesting modification. Hmm. I want to spend my turn. Instead of moving my players around, I'm going to use that dice roll to move the base and all my captured players with it. How frustrating would that be? Once you have created your game pieces, you can place them and try to determine how or whether gameplay will work. For my example, I'm going to use Game Structor, that's a thing I linked you to last week, to create a hexagonal game board with movable players, flags, and obstacles, as well as immovable bases. As we have seen, though, Game Structor is a little buggy for us to use interactively, uh, so I'm only using it to generate images for this demo. Uh, you may do the same in the future, or you can use paper and pencil or any other materials you have on hand. Since we're working remotely, you can use Jamboard, you can use Google Docs, Google Drawings, whatever works, so that you and your teammates can collaborate in real time online. If we were in the classroom, I could also print my board in pieces and glue them onto cardboard to make a physical version of the game. Uh, there's no limit to what we could do if we were here in person, guys. Uh, it's kind of a shame. Anyway, uh, here's what I came up with. The brown and white units are uh, places where players can move. The black and gray pattern areas around the outside are out of bounds, and no gameplay happens there. Uh, the white units in the center are the neutral zone, which separates the two territories, and I've decided, in which no capturing may occur. The green units are flag bases, and the red units are hostage bases. So... Uh, Next, I added players and flags for purple and orange teams and placed them in their starting positions. So you have like some players on their starting tiles. This is the starting position for my capture the flag game. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, oh yeah, notice each team has to capture their flag from the opponent's territory. Um, each team's territory has a base in either corner so that capturing the flag and releasing hostages must be separate endeavors, right? If you're coming back with the flag, getting your hostages is going to be way out of your way. Um, so if one player uh, may occupy a unit at a time and hostages are arranged around the hostage base, there's a maximum of three tiles that can be occupied by hostages around the base, leaving one player to free its teammates. It is at this point in this example when we can start to determine the degree to which player moves should be determined by strategy or chance and how likely those moves, uh, sorry, and how exactly those moves should work. Everybody with me so far? What I would do from here is test gameplay with a few different sets of rules about how turns work and figure out which one works best. Uh, so like what, where's that right balance of fun and challenging? Uh, so here's a few ideas. On each turn, each team rolls dice and must move any player, sorry, must move any number of its players, a sum of that number of tiles in any direction. So uh, if I roll two dice and I've rolled a five and a six, I have 11 moves to do with as I want. Let's say. 
maybe on each turn, each team rolls dice and may move any number of its players and some of that number of tiles or fewer. Maybe I don't want to move 11 moves. Maybe I just want to move nine. I can do that. On each turn, each team has a total of four moves to distribute among its players, but must use all four moves. So maybe instead of rolling two dice, I'm rolling four four-sided dice and assigning one of those numbers to each one of my players, depending on what I want my strategy to be. Right offhand, I'm gonna tell you right now, that sounds like it would make the turn take a long time. You're waiting for your opponent to be like, hmm, I want this, no wait, I want, no, I want that dice roll to be for, uh, wait, I can't tell which player I wanna move three and which one I wanna move two. And so you're waiting a long time for your opponent to be like, which is fine. I mean, it happens in chess all the time, but I don't know, it, it might annoy you. Uh, but worth trying, worth trying. Um, maybe on each term, each team has a total of four moves to distribute among its players, but you can use fewer. And so on. Additional dice, different number of fixed moves, experimentation. Uh, Leo says, add some more obstacles. Yeah, totally valid uh, place to take this. Getting more detailed, I would experiment with different attributes of capturing and liberating. Here they are. Maybe players capture or liberate by advancing to occupy the tile or unit of the player flag they're capturing, uh, blah, 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 blah. I'll let you read that. It's all, it's all up on the Google Classroom. So um, you can use the, the template in the assignment to uh, describe your game and explain the rules. Lastly, I want to talk about engine building games because I actually did this last summer. I, I, I finished teaching for the spring and I took my uh, engine building game template and I actually worked it up into a prototype, which I have here. And I tested it out with some friends during a camping trip. Um, and it was cool and it needs a lot of work, but it was definitely like, I was like, whoa, I'm, I like made something. So it was exciting. I want to share that excitement with you. Here's uh, the thought process that led to that very exciting event this summer. Engine building games. Engine building games. What are engine building games? Engine building games usually combine strategy and chance with the goal of acquiring or obtaining some kind of currency or resource. In most engine building games, players must acquire one type of resource that enables them to acquire another type of resource. That's where the engine metaphor comes from. Each player is creating a system for themselves that is designed to help them acquire more resources. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's a type of game where players are creating systems that guide their strategy. There are typically costs to acquiring resources so that players must weigh each decision in terms of its costs and benefits in both the short term and the long term. This type of decision making can be very challenging, but because of the way engine building yields results, these games tend to be not only fun, but also addictive. Many popular computer games are versions of engine building games. Any Sim or Sims games, rely on the same principles as engine building where you start with few limited resources and use them to grow something bigger, uh, to develop something more complex that yields more resources, which are then used to keep growing. The same is true of games like Civilization or Age of Empires. Uh, the engine building game that you're probably most familiar with is called Monopoly. In Monopoly, players start out with a few limited resources in the form of play money and roll dice that's your chance element, in order to advance on the game board where you may spend your money in order to buy property. So more property equals less money, right? But having property can earn you money. But landing on other people's property costs money and so on, plus other ways that money and property can be developed, earned, spent, or lost. Monopoly is hotly debated in the domestic gaming world because it suffers from one huge flaw. Once a player becomes more successful in building their engine than the others, it is basically over for everyone else and stops being fun for them. For this reason, the best versions of Monopoly are probably modifications that people have made in order to solve that problem. And they are out there, you can look for them. When you design a game, it should be challenging and fun for everyone playing it from beginning to end. That should be your main goal. 
right? Uh, here are a few other examples of engine building games that you should check out. And if you go to Tabletopia, I think it's called, uh, I have that in our online gaming resources link, uh, you can check out many of these games. Um, Wingspan. I can't even, ah, oh, it's so good. Wingspan is a beautiful and robust engine building game skinned as a birder's nerd fest in which you have to try to acquire bird cards and place them on your individual board in order to score points according to directions and values on the cards. Each turn you use the bird cards you've placed on your board to generate more actions that in turn earn various types of value points. So you're trying to acquire bird cards and uh, earn the, the resources needed in order to play them on your board. And once you do that, uh, the next time you, you need to do a turn, you're advancing past all these other bird cards that do stuff for you. So you have to like plan in advance how you're gonna use those turns. And it's, uh, it's wonderfully cyclical. I would say the one flaw with Wingspan, and if you read about it or heard about it on Shut Up, Sit Down, they may have mentioned this, is that it's not very head-to-head. -head. You kind of feel a little bit like you're not really playing against or with other people. You're just kind of playing at the same time as other people and comparing your scores at the end. I would say that is the one kind of fatal flaw of Wingspan. It's not enough to make it not fun, though, because it's still so gratifying. The Quacks of Quedlinburg is a very fun German engine building game skinned in the theme of medieval alchemy, in which players make potions by acquiring various types of ingredient tokens, some of which are harmful to the cauldron and some of which are beneficial and yield more potions. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so... I do talk about those issues on this slide. I haven't read this in a while, obviously. Uh, so um, both of these games kind of don't have a lot of head-to-head -head play. They're more like parallel play, but not completely. Head-to-head -head means that each player's actions directly affect and are directly affected by other players' actions during each turn. This gives players a stake in the outcome of the game, not only for themselves, but also for their opponents. Parallel play is actually a term we see when discussing early childhood development because it's the way that young toddlers play when they're together. You put them in a room with some toys, they both start playing with the toys and almost seem to ignore each other. But on some level, they realize that it's an activity they're doing together. And this does in fact make it more fun for them. In gaming, like you know, our adult grown up gaming, parallel play just means that players have less control over outcomes for other players. Uh, or their actions affect their own ability or inability to meet the goals of the game, but not so much those of their opponents. Head-to-head -head or parallel styles of play don't necessarily make a game more or less enjoyable, but they can. Um, how to design an engine building game. We've got five minutes. I'm going to see if I can get through this in five minutes. First thing we want to do is list a few goals for how we want our game to be. It's got to be fun because engine building is inherently gratifying. You make an effort, you expend some resources, and you start building something that generates more resources and you sweat a little bit because you had to give up some resources to get those resources, and it's fun to see the whole thing work. It's challenging. Expending resources should involve risk. You don't know whether your expenditure will earn you a return on your investment, even though you've calculated the level of risk as best as you could. Okay, and uh, I want my game to be head-to-head -head because I want it to be really engaging. I also want it to be socially interactive. I want players to be able to affect outcomes for each other and not just themselves. I want my game to generate feelings, but you don't have to do the same thing when you design your game, all right? Uh, think about the mechanics of engine building. Not these guys per se, uh, but rather the systems of actions and consequences, costs and benefits, materials, gains, materials, loss that could drive the game. But guess what, guys? I totally called my game the mechanics of engine building and used that amazing photo for the cover, all right? Uh, Okay, so yes, those guys. Just as an example, I'm gonna call my game Engine, and it's gonna be about building an engine. I'm using this example so that there's a very direct connection between the idea of engine building and the imagery of the game, but we're gonna get into skinning more later. It says next week, ignore next, time is meaningless. For the purposes of this assignment, you should absolutely not copy my example. It's copyright, look, I made it, you guys. You can't have this, it's mine, but rather, imitate the thought process that I use to create it, all right? I'm envisioning a game that has a system, which, ooh, we're getting late. We might run over, guys. 
just letting you know, we might run over the time. Uh, <laughs> I can't keep you here, but I will, I will continue making this video for everyone. Uh, I want players to acquire materials, but at the cost of another type of material. I want players to use these materials to build an engine, but at the cost of another type of material. And I want players to use this engine to acquire more of material A, maybe, or something that goes towards the win. Uh, this is an engine system because it's cyclical. You use A to get B, B to get C, C to get A. And the engine in the above example is actually another type of material itself. Now you can start to assign names, values, and even more overlapping uh, engine systems to the components of your game. Since I want my game to involve head-to-head -head strategy, I want to be sure to build that interplay into the rules as well so that players can have some degree of control over the way other players gain or lose certain materials. Now let's plug our ideas into that formula. Players buy engine parts or bolts at the cost of money, right? Players use these engine parts to build an engine, but at the cost of bolts, because they got to bolt them together. Players use this engine to earn more money by racing a car, but they risk damaging all or part of their engine in a collision. Now we have uh, to create a system of value to make the system of gameplay work. The gameplay system is the way that the game elements, those are the components and actions that I underlined in the description, uh, affect one another, right? Are you with me? Players start with a certain amount of money and no engine bolts or parts, right? You wanna build an engine, you got some money. You gotta have some money going into it. It's a capitalist system. Engine parts cost different amounts and can make your engine more or less valuable. Let's say, you want cheap parts, you're gonna get a bad engine. A more valuable engine takes more money to build, but will earn you more money when you race it. Players can use their turn to do one of several things. You can buy or sell engine parts, buy or sell bolts, assemble an engine, or race your car. Actions describe the things players can do on each turn and the consequences of doing those things. The best games give players a choice of actions, which is how they can develop strategies. So in my game on each turn, players have a choice to take one of several actions. Uh, and those are the actions, you can see what they are. Um, I, might, I might just say you should read this in the classroom, in the Google Classroom. Um, we, it is two o'clock, I cannot legally make you sit here and listen to me talk for another 10 minutes. Legally, I don't know. I, I, it wouldn't be very nice if I kept you after, right? So it's two o'clock, guys. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, cut the video at this point. I want you to make sure that you go into uh, this material in the Google Classroom and look through this stuff as you continue to uh, develop your games in Teams. Um, this will help inform what you decide to do uh, the next time we meet, which will be next week, okay? Thank you for coming to art class. Have a wonderful rest of your Monday. Good, bye.